Now, Professor Sir Paul Nurse, President of the Royal Society, a geneticist, winner of the Nobel Prize for Physiology in Medicine in 2001, worked in New York as President of the Rockefeller University, currently Director of the Francis Crick Institute. Paul Nurse. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here, although unfortunately I should admit at the outset that I was not an undergraduate at Wadham College. <laughs> I was pleased to be asked to speak at this celebration of John Wilkins and the invention of modern science because I think we have a lot to thank John Wilkins for. He was a 17th century divine, brought up in Oxford, with a goldsmith as his father. In 1648, Wilkins was appointed, as we have heard, Warden of Wadham, by the parliamentarian visitors who were purging Oxford University of Royalists. Later, he was appointed Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. I believe they paid more than Wadham. Although that was a rather brief appointment, because in turn, he was ejected from that position, this time by the Royalists, after the restoration of Charles II. Subsequently, he became Dean of Ripon and the Bishop of Chester. But most importantly, at least for this celebration, he was one of the founding members of the Royal Society of London, the oldest continuously operating science academy in the world. He was a major founding member. He was elected chair of the first meeting of the society in Gresham College, London, November 1660. The founding of the Royal Society was one of the more significant events of the Enlightenment. And many would say that the society played the primary role in the invention of modern science. One of the more long-lasting and perhaps less well-recognized consequences of the early activities of the Royal Society was the promotion of what I will call a sociology of science, of how science should be carried out and how scientists should work together in a community. And in this talk, I will argue that it was the establishment of a society of scientists who embraced these new practices which generated a highly effective research endeavor that persists today, and that these ways of working reflect several aspects of John Wilkins' character. So what was Wilkins like? Thumbnail sketch of his life and character have been written by John Gribbin in his book, The Fellowship. Wilkins, as we've heard, lived in troubled often intolerant and divisive times, with political differences between parliamentarians and royalists, and religious differences between Catholics and the various flavors of Protestantism, ranging from the Church of England to more radical dissenting sects. Although Wilkins was a bishop and a parliamentarian, indeed was married to Oliver Cromwell's youngest sister, he was in fact able to work well with many across the political and religious divides. He was unusually tolerant of a range of opinions, whether religious, political, or intellectual, and encouraged scientists from all parts of the Christian church and from different backgrounds to work together on scientific projects. He was gregarious, a skilled politician. He acted as a catalyst, connecting scientists and in encouraging their collaboration, most famously introducing Robert Hooke to Robert Boyle, initiating their experiments using the newly invented air pump to investigate low atmospheric pressures. More generally, he was a champion, indeed a popularizer, of experimental science and of new scientific advances, expounding the theories of Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo. He was a defender of the freedom of universities, always incidentally required. A freedom, a defender of the freedom of universities, was inclusive in discussion, bringing scientists together to discuss experiments. 
He was a man of curiosity, with wide interests, ranging from mechanical investigations, discussions of submarines, flying machines, and the possibility of life on the moon, through to the construction of transparent beehives to study bee behavior. He had a reputation as a practical joker. Connecting a pipe to a statue in his garden to make it speak whilst he was hiding in the bushes. <laughs> like the 17th century scholar and statesman Francis Bacon, of which we've uh, also heard this evening, 50 years earlier, he thought science should be used for the good of humankind. At Wadham, he encouraged an experimental science club, attracting scientists like Boyle and Christopher Wren, in whose great building, of course, we sit today, and carried out experiments himself into both physics and into agriculture. As we've heard from Marcus, he was very systematic in his studies, emphasizing the primacy of accurate observation and rational, skeptical argument. Stephen Shapin, historian and sociologist of science, comments on Wilkin's philosophical approach, referring to the way that Wilkins suggested that the learned could be distinguished from those that Wilkins called the vulgar. What Wilkins said was, you may as soon persuade some country peasant that the moon is made of green cheese, as we say, as that it is bigger than his cartwheel, since both seem equally to contradict his sight, and he has not reason enough to lead him further than his senses. What Wilkins is saying here, of course, is that it is important in science not to rely simply on immediate sense impressions. Observations need to be tempered by a critical and skeptical attitude and to be interrogated by rational analysis. Now, this character sketch identifies Wilkins as a curious, skeptical person wanting to understand the world and wanting to promote the usefulness of science for the benefit of humankind. He encouraged tolerance, freedom of thought, collaborations, promoted the formation of a scientific community to publicly debate science and to demonstrate experiments. He argued that science should be based on a respect for reliable experiments and observations that should be shared with others. These characteristics greatly informed the foundation of the Royal Society. So are they still relevant for the practice of science today? Well, I want to start with curiosity. Curiosity for many scientists is the main impetus of their research. In my experience, scientists are driven by a passion, almost an unhealthy passion, of wanting to know, of needing to understand. Curiosity is natural in children and often persists at high levels in scientists. You could say, in fact, that scientists never really grow up. A burning curiosity was typical of many early fellows of the Royal Society. It is a defining feature of most scientists today. A consequence of needing to know is a drive to study the world, to carry out observations and experiments, to generate accurate descriptions of how the natural world behaves provides the evidence which forms the bedrock of science. Even the most beautiful idea in science generally comes to nothing unless it is supported by observational or experimental evidence. This emphasis on the primacy of data is nicely summed up in the Royal Society's motto, Nullius in Verba, which roughly translates as take no one's word for it. This was a reaction against the book-oriented emphasis of the scholarly tradition and put observations and experiments at the center of science and the discussion of science. These two qualities of curiosity and respect for evidence 
a reliance on accurate descriptions of the natural world, are evident in Wilkins' character. I like to think that a third aspect of his character, his humour, may also be relevant for the practice of science. An important step in the process of science is the movement from observations and experiments, first to identify regularities and patterns, and then to generate ideas and hypotheses that explain the workings of the natural world. These steps require imagination and creativity. And Arthur Kersler, in his book, The Act of Creation, surprisingly, but rather convincingly in my view, argues that there is a relationship between intellectual creativity and humor. Both of these activities rely heavily on the juxtapositioning of the unexpected, making connections between thoughts or events which have not previously been recognized. Surprising conjunctions occur both in humor and during creative thinking in science. Perhaps Wilkins' playfulness by surprising his guests with talking statues might be related to his ability to have creative thoughts in science. A key feature of science is uh, making both observations and experimental data and the reasoning associated with their interpretation publicly available for interrogation. Again, as we've already heard. A primary purpose of such public exposure is to encourage debate, discourse, and criticism that challenges the work being presented. If the science survives such engaged scrutiny of other expert scientific peers who are familiar with the area being considered, then the conclusions of that work can be considered more secure and a more reliable explanation for the natural phenomenon under study. It means science knowledge essentially evolves from tentative understanding to increasingly secure understanding. So scrutiny through peer review is a central part of scientific research today and of course was championed by Wilkins. The society early on carried out public demonstrations of experiments to convince other fellows of their validity. Robert Hooke, also closely associated with Oxford, you'll see a plaque of him um, um, down in, um, in the high street, um, was um, employed as the curator of experiments, to demonstrate experiments, and these demonstrations played a major part in the society's meetings. I sometimes think, in fact I'm contemplating it, that perhaps we should reinstate the position of curator of experiments at the society. Just watch this space. <laughs> However, more relevant today um, for making science publicly available, of course, are peer-reviewed scientific research papers gathered together in scientific journals. These papers need to contain detailed explanations of how the observations were collected or the experiments carried out, allowing them, if necessary, to be repeated by others. They should also promote discussion of the work being described. This concept of the scientific journal was also invented by the Royal Society within a few years of its founding. Next year will be the 350th anniversary of the first volume of the journal uh, Philosophical Transactions, promoted by Henry um, Oldenburg, first published in 1665, and the first scientific journal in the world. This journal ever eventually spawned the tens of thousands of scientific journals that are published today. And these form an essential part of modern science, and it came out of the birth of the Royal Society. This feature of public scrutiny of scientific work and the development of consensus views among scientific experts about a piece of scientific work or a scientific explanation is very important. Science draws its strength from such consensual positions because if properly carried out, peer scrutiny by experts 
means that the work under consideration has been extensively reviewed and has survived repeated tests and repeated challenges. Some pub public commentators of science do not understand the importance of scrutinized consensus, thinking it is a lazy, middle-of-the-road consensual position. Nothing could be further from the truth. When alternative explanations to a current consensus emerge and become more effective at explaining a natural phenomenon, then the scrutiny of expert scientists will lead to that alternative being adopted and, in my experience, adopted rather rapidly. That is how you become famous, in fact, in science. It's a very self-corrective mechanism. Now, effective peer review in science works best when it's pursued in particular ways uh, which characterize an effective scientific society. And these embrace further aspects, in my view, of Wilkins character. Debate and discourse are best carried out in an open and tolerant manner, as Wilkins was open and tolerant. There needs to be respect for the opinions of others and for the freedom of thought, again, as Wilkins argued. Scientific issues should be settled by the strength of argument, not by scientific hierarchy working through the seniority of the scientists involved. Discourse should be managed in a culture of mutual respect. Passion should be directed at the argument and not at the people engaged in the argument. Of course, this is not always easy to achieve, <laughs> as after all, scientists are only human. But scientific debate should avoid the tactics of the polemicists and the lobbyists who employ personal insult, misrepresentation of views, and the tricks of the debating chamber. I'm sure you know the sort of people I'm referring to. <laughs> I have little patience with those driven by politics, ideology, or religion who distort science, cherry-pick data, and tell half-truths to justify their own preconceived ideas. If they cannot be convinced of their misdemeanors, serial offenders who continue to distort science in these ways must be counted with vigor, because otherwise they damage the whole scientific endeavor. Scientific debate should also embrace a skeptical attitude, not only of other scientists' data and opinions, but particularly of the scientists' own data and opinions. Healthy skepticism, as long as it does not paralyze action, which can, I have to say, be a problem, is a key characteristic of the scientific community. Sometimes contrarians take up extreme positions far from the scientific consensus and argue a defense of their own opinions because they are taking a skeptical attitude to the majority view. However, in all debates, the science must always be well argued and be supported by evidence. Quite often, despite uh, their enthusiasm for skepticism, contrarians um, often show almost no skepticism concerning their own arguments. I get letters like from people like that almost every day. Two other character traits of Wilkins are important um, for science. The first was his encouragement of scientists to collaborate and to work together. Collaborators bring different skill sets, expertise, and ways of thinking to bear on a problem. And the very act of collaboration encourages a critical approach through dialogue and argument at all stages of a scientific investigation. The second aspect of his character is to keep a constant eye on the possible usefulness of science for the benefit of humankind. Science is generally best driven by curiosity, as I have argued, but society as a whole supports science not only for what we learn about the natural world to enhance our culture and civilization, as we've been hearing about cosmology only this evening, but also, and probably for most people more so, 
for how that science can improve the lot of humankind. How can it improve our health and our quality of our lives, drive our economies in a sustainable way, protect our environment, reduce poverty throughout the world? Thinking of how science can be useful as an important aspect of scientific research. These various ways of working and characteristics play critical roles in defining the scientific community and the scientific endeavor. They provide a sociological framework within which scientists can act effectively together and can generate self-correcting advancements in our knowledge of the natural world. They reflect aspects of John Wilkins' character which informed the invention of modern science with the founding of the Royal Society, and they continue to inform the scientific endeavor of today. So thank you, John Wilkins, for all that you've done for science. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, come and do maths here. Yeah, solve the problem.